I'm Zeb Elef, Associate Professor of Jewish History at Turo College and Hebrew Theological College. And I'm joined uh, with Professor David Dallas, the author, co-author, or editor of 12 books, including Religion and State in the American Jewish Experience, co-authored with Jonathan Sarna. His most recent book is Jewish Justices of the Supreme Court, which was a finalist for the 2017 National Jewish Book Award in the category of American Jewish Studies. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous tome, one that doesn't just look at the Jewishness of important political figures in the public sphere, but also understands their Jewishness and their receptivity uh, of their Jewishness by Jews and non-Jews. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Donald, for joining. Oh, you're welcome. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And we're not going to be speaking about justices per se. That would have to wait until the early 20th <laughs> century. Uh, but another figure, uh, who prefigures, in a certain sense, uh, the role of um, uh, uh, the image, uh, the image of a political leader uh, that has an inherently Jewish reception uh, is Abraham Lincoln. You've studied uh, someone who has a, uh, a Jewish story, he wasn't Jewish, of course, I don't think anybody's made uh, any claim of the sort, uh, but, Lincoln has had a curious relationship, not just with Jews in the mid 19th century, but his legacy moving forward for the American Jewish community as we move throughout the 19th and early 20th century, and even to today. Lincoln occupies a very unique space yeah. for American Jews. Oh, okay. Abraham Lincoln was the first American president to have several personal Jewish friends and acquaintances. Um, one of Lincoln's earliest friends and one of the first to suggest that he seek the presidency uh, was Abraham Jonas, an immigrant from England who settled in Quincy, Illinois in 1838. In Quincy, he was admitted to the bar, established a law practice, and became acquainted with another local attorney by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Jonas remained active in Illinois politics, joining the new Republican Party with Lincoln in 1854 and actively supporting Lincoln in his first presidential campaign against Stephen A. Douglas in 1860. Lincoln appreciated the efforts of Jonas and in a February 1860 letter called him one of my most valued friends. In 1862, Lincoln appointed Jonas postmaster of Quincy, Illinois, a position he held until his death in 1864. Now, in the late summer of 1862, Lincoln was introduced to the British-born podiatrist, Issachar Zachary. The president, who had been having trouble with his feet, learned that such luminaries as Senator Henry Clay and the newspaper editor William Cullen Bryan, longtime editor of the New York Evening Post, had suffered from similar ailments and that, in, and that Dr. Zachary had treated them with good results. The doctor's successful treatment of Lincoln earned him the president's praise and this led to Zachary's appointment as White House chiropodist, the 19th century term for podiatrist. Now, Lincoln expressed his confidence in the ability and wisdom of Zachary, his closest Jewish friend after Abraham's Zonus, Jonas, in another matter, this one of great national import. In 1863, Lincoln sent Zachary on a peace mission, a secret peace mission to New Orleans to appraise the military situation and to sound out the prospects for entering peace negotiations with the Confederacy. In a letter to Lincoln, Zachary indicated the conditions were not yet right for such uh, discussions or such negotiations. Another Jewish friend who Lincoln admired and respected was Adolphus Solomons, a Washington DC businessman and leader of the Red Cross who was a major supporter of Lincoln in the presidential race of 1860 and who took an active part in planning the inauguration of every president from Lincoln to William Howard Taft. His influence with Lincoln and with the Republican leadership of the Congress was profound. He was, for example, able to arrange for Rabbi Morris uh, J. Raphael of New York City's congregation, B'nai Jeshurun, to have the privilege of being the first rabbi to deliver, deliver an invocation at a session of Congress, an historical first. Um, Lincoln had several Jewish Republican supporters when he ran for president in 1860. 
Among them was Moses Aaron Dropsy, a Philadelphia attorney and philanthropist who incidentally donated the money for what became Dropsy College in Philadelphia, who was, a, who was also a founder of the Republican Party in Philadelphia, which strongly supported Lincoln. One of the notable Lincoln supporters was Lewis N. Dembitz, a co-founder of the Republican Party in Kentucky and the uncle of Lewis Dembitz Brandeis, who Woodrow Wilson would appoint to the Supreme Court in 1916. Dembitz, a child prodigy who read Greek and Latin and spoke several languages while still a teenager, studied law in his native Prague, and after moving to the United States and settling in Louisville, Kentucky, published highly regarded reference works on Kentucky law. An Orthodox Jew and a fervent abolitionist who translated Uncle Tom's Cabin into German, Dembitz uh, named one of his sons after Henry Clay and the other after Abraham Lincoln. At the age of 27 in 1860, Dembitz had already been important in Republican, uh, as a Republican Party political leader in Kentucky. And tradition holds that Dembitz gave one of the nominating speeches for Lincoln in the Republican National Convention in 1860. Another ardent uh, so Lincoln supporter was Moritz Pinar of Missouri, who tradition holds that together with Louis Dembitz was one of the three delegates to the Republican National Convention in 1860, who placed Lincoln's name in nomination. Kinner was the editor of the outspoken abolitionist newspaper, the Kansas Post, and one of Lincoln's earliest supporters in the presidential race of 1860. When Lincoln wanted to repay Kinner for his support by offering him a consular diplomatic post, that is, as a counsel, Pinner declined, choosing instead to enlist in the Union Army. One other uh, staunch Lincoln supporter was Simon Wolfe, a Washington, D.C. attorney and power broker, who by 1864 the most, it was the most influential Jewish Republican leader in the country. Having begun his political um, career as a Democrat, Wolfe, who was fervently anti-slavery and an admirer of Abraham Lincoln, had become a Republican in 1860 and personally congratulated Lincoln on the historic Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Wolfe, who met with Lincoln several times at the White House and who would campaign for and advise every Republican president from Lincoln to William Howard Taft and would become a duly recognized spokesman for the American Jewish community, community on all political issues and candidates he, uh, Wolf emerged as Lincoln's most prominent Jewish advisor throughout the Civil War years. Solomon's, Dembitz, Pinner, and Wolf all actively campaigned for Lincoln's re-election in 1864, mobilizing electoral support for Lincoln amongst Jewish Republican voters throughout the country, as did Abraham Dittenhofer, a young attorney who motivated by a strong belief that Jews in particular should oppose the institution of slavery, associated himself with the new abolitionist Republican party in the mid 1850s, campaigned for Lincoln in 1860 and by 1864 had risen in prominence to become one of New York State's electors on the Lincoln ticket. In his memoir, How We Elected Lincoln, Dittenhofer recalled several personal interviews and meetings he had with President Lincoln. And he recalled his well-considered estimate of the great emancipator's character and personality. And recounted the prominent role that he, Dittenhofer, played in Lincoln's re-election in 1864. He wasn't known for his humility in that respect. <laughs> Lincoln's gratefulness for the loyalty and support of his Jewish friends and admirers was especially evident it, as the struggle in the struggle to have rabbis officially recognized as chaplains in the armed forces. Now, while army chaplains of the Christian faith had been serving in the armed forces of the United States as far back as the Revolutionary War, it was not until the Civil War that sufficient influence was brought to bear to grant Jewish chaplains influ uh, the right to serve. The American army had 30 chaplains at the start of the Civil War, none of them Jewish. A Congressional Act of July 22, 1861 allowed each army regiment one chaplain who had to be, though, an ordained Christian clergyman. 
Uh, upset by this unfair treatment, Colonel Max Friedman, commanding officer of the 65th Regiment of the 5th Pennsylvania Cavalry, persuaded a New York rabbi by the name of, Rab of Arnold Fischel to apply for a commission as chaplain of his re regiment. The application was turned down by the Secretary of War because Fischel was not, quote, a minister of some Christian denomination. This decision so upset the Board of Delegates of American Israelites organized in 1859 to fight for Jewish rights that it urged Rabbi Fischel to travel to Washington to discuss the matter directly with President Lincoln. A grand swell of Jewish, a groundswell of Jewish insistence that Jews serving in the country uh, in the armed forces deserve to be given their own chaplains as well as Rabbi Fischel's own direct lobbying of President Lincoln, led to President Lincoln's historic decision to change the congressional law restricting military chaplains to Christian clergy only. Mm -hmm. True to his promise, Lincoln submitted to Congress a list of proposed changes in the chaplaincy law. After much debate, the proposed changes passed the Senate in March 1862, and the House of Representatives in July 1862. President Lincoln immediately demonstrated his support for the new legislation by appointing Jewish chaplains as soon as he was requested to do so. First of all, upon the recommendation of the Board of Ministers of the Hebrew Congregations of Philadelphia, President Lincoln appointed Rabbi Jacob Frankel of Road of Shalom Congregation who on September 18th, 1862, became the first Jewish military chaplain in American history. The American Jewish community was profoundly grateful for President Lincoln's swift and historic action, which a grateful Jewish community would remember for generations to come. The American Jewish community was also grateful for another important action taken by Abraham Lincoln. On December 17, 1862, Lincoln's top general, Ulysses S. Grant, issued uh, his infamous Orders No. 11, ordering the expulsion of Jews as a class from the territory under his military command, the Department of Tennessee, which included northern Mississippi and parts of Kentucky. And uh, these Jews were then given 24 hours in which to leave. It was further stipulated that any Jew who returned to the area would be summarily arrested. Jews from the Department of Tennessee traveled to Washington to protest Lincoln's order, which remains the most notorious anti-Jewish edict by a government official in American history. To the delight and profound gratitude, excuse me, of the Jewish community, President Lincoln rescinded Grant's anti-Jewish order two weeks after its issuance. The American Jewish communi community would remain grateful to Abraham Lincoln for both quickly revoking a Grant's order number 11 and for enabling Ar uh, rabbis to serve as military chaplains for decades to come. Lincoln uh, would remain a beloved hero to American Jews. Abraham Lincoln would enjoy a special place in American Jewish history and Jewish historical memory. When Lincoln was assassinated on April 15, 1865, dying on the Sabbath day of the Passover holiday, instead of celebrating the Passover of 1865, joyfully in their homes and synagogues, Jews grieved and mourned for their fallen hero. As a result of the fact that so many Jews happened to be in synagogue or on their way there when word of Lincoln's death became known, many of the first prayers memorializing the slain president were Jewish ones. Lincoln's friend Adolphus Solomons noted at the time, it is a singular fact, he wrote, that it was the Israelites' privilege here, as well as elsewhere, to be the first to offer in their places of worship, prayers for the repose of the soul of President Lincoln. Newspapers preserved accounts of those prayers. At Temple Emanuel in New York City, according to the New York Times, the congregation rose and it by a simultaneous impulse repeated the Kaddish, the traditional Jewish prayer for mourning. Jewish leaders had the opportunity to deliver polished eulogies for Lincoln during the ensuing days when funeral services were held across the country 
As Lincoln's coffin made its more than 1600 mile trip from Washington DC to New York to Springfield, Illinois where Lincoln was buried. Practically every Jewish religious leader in America eulogized Lincoln. Rabbis spoke of Lincoln's character, his values, his leadership and his religious faith. They compared him to great, the greatest of human heroes, particularly to Abraham, his biblical namesake. Lewis and Dembitz, who as I noted earlier as a delegate from tech, Kentucky had voted for Lincoln at the Republican National Convention of 1860, claimed that Lincoln was sometimes known as Rabbi Abraham, as if he was one of our nation and of the seed of Israel. In 1927, Emanuel Hertz, a prominent New York attorney and book collector who specialized in the collecting rare books and material about Lincoln, published Abraham Lincoln, The Tribute of the Synagogue, a collection of Jewish eulogies and addresses about Lincoln, written at the time of his death and during the following 62 years. The foreword to the volume was written by Hertz's brother, Rabbi Dr. Joseph Hertz, the chief rabbi of the British Empire. In his eulogy for Lincoln, Italian-born Rabbi Sabato Moraes, one of Lincoln's most ardent rabbinic supporters and an outspoken ab abolitionist, compared the president to Hillel, the outstanding first century BCE Jewish sage and teacher who was motivated by the golden rule of Leviticus, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. One of the most moving tributes to Lincoln was that of Romanian-born Solomon Schechter, who was only a teenager when Lincoln was assassinated, and who came to America in 1901 to accept the presidency of New York's Jewish Theological Seminary. In his memorial address that Schechter wrote in 1909, commemorating the centenary of Lincoln's birth that was included in Hertz's volume, Schechter articulated these feelings about the great emancipator. We may be grateful to God for having given us such a great soul as Lincoln, who under God gave this nation a new birth of freedom, and to our dear country, which by its institutions and its people rendered possible the greatness for which Abraham Lincoln shall stand forever. Thank you.